Hello and welcome to Africa's number one TV health show, Your Health in Your Hands. My name is Dr. David Ajibade and I'll be your host today. Remember, our goal is to provide the average Nigerian, average African, probably average Black person with the tools and the insights they need to be able to take control of their health. And as you know, as we've been saying this for the past three or so years, that our, the way our bodies work is not exactly the same as the way of the average white person's body, body works. And so we need to understand the differences so we can actually intelligently take care, uh, control of our health. Now, let me take you to your attention to this picture. From the picture, you can see that cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death worldwide. Well, you may be saying that, well, that doesn't apply to us Africans because we, our own is malaria, infectious disease, and so on, and tuberculosis, and so AIDS, and so on and so forth. That may be true until 2015, because after 2015, as far as sub-Saharan Africa is concerned, strokes and heart attacks have cracked the top five for the first time, and it isn't getting any better. We are now seeing that over 80% of all strokes, and this is, this is from the World Health Organization, 80% of all strokes, of all deaths from strokes, I should say, will be happening in the third world countries, especially African countries, maybe particularly sub-Saharan African countries. One of the obvious reasons is, is that our healthcare systems are not as well developed. Other reasons is that there's a lot of ignorance. Yes, we can blame tropical diseases, uh, administrative problems and so on and so forth. But it points to one fact, in the midst of all that, it, it, it certainly means that we have to be able to take control of our health. In other words, we need to understand the practices and principles that strengthen our cardiovascular system and the practices and principles that weaken our cardiovascular system so that we can adopt the former and uh, shall we say, refrain from or eschew the latter. <laughs> anyway, that's what we're going to be talking about in the next few minutes. So please, if, you are, if your friends and family are not around, call them, text them, do whatever you can to get them on after this hour short break, because this is going to be super, super, super important. All right, see you soon. Welcome back. With me on the show today is Dr. Muni Adani Jo. She is a cardiologist, consultant cardiologist, and co founder and medical director of Naveen Healthcare. Welcome to the show, Ma. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, great. So, you, you, you are in the center of I don't know, everything when Nigeria is concerned, I guess, except for government. And you <laughs> are people of a lot of different health, um, cardiovascular problems, everything from hypertension to strokes and so on and so forth. What would you say is the number one mistake Nigerians make when it comes to uh, care of their cardiovascular system? Mm, the number one mistake, I would say we don't do enough preventive cardiology. We don't do enough prevention you know we tend to wait for something to go wrong and then we now start looking for help by which time it's too late or almost too late so we, we need to do more prevention we need to do more preventive cardiology more screenings more lifestyle changes and things like that yeah i think that's the number one thing i like it i agree but that's there's a lot to unpack because as you know we, tell, we doctors just tend to talk in generalities and it's like, okay, now you, know, said, you, know, you said screening, you said uh, prevention, you said this and you said that. There's, to the average person, they were like, yeah, we've heard it all before. What, how do we break it down so that when people have watched this show, they can go back and say, okay, I need to make this, this and that change. For instance, hypertension. I, I know we've talked about this before. Many people don't even know they're hypertensive. Uh, and I guess diabetes too is another thing that people find out. So let's try and unpack that a little bit. So, because, um, yeah, let's, we, 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 let's try and unpack that so it can apply to the common man. Okay, so simply, prevention is both lifestyle changes 
changes. My lifestyle changes will mean how you eat and what you eat. Exercise, okay, how you exercise and the kind of exercise you do, as well as preventive. Now, preventive medicine just means you going for your annual medical checkup. Many people think annual medical checkup is what the rich people do or is what fancy people do. Some think it's expensive. Some think doctors always find something. You know, there are all, all kinds of myths surrounding preventive, you know, preventive health. And it's as yeah. simple as just be your blood pressure. The average pharmacy store in Lagos, you know, do free blood pressures. So if you have malaria, for example, you know, you're going to buy malaria medicine or you're going to buy painkillers or something, just ask them, can you please do my blood pressure? Many of them even do blood sugar. Just ask them, can you please do my blood pressure and blood sugar? And you're going to pay almost next to nothing, you know, to get right. those checks. Right. right. Another issue is many people, once they check their blood pressure and it's high, they keep making excuses. Oh, because I didn't sleep last night. Oh, because someone I know before I came in. Oh, it's because I'm stressed. And then this, you know, this festers, they don't seek help, even though they've even checked, they know, or the ones that actually go for the fancy checkups and they get their results and the result says you have this, this and that. They have this God forbid mentality. They just put the results in their drawer and they're like, it's not my portion and they forget about it. You know, but yeah. that doesn't mean that they're not hypertensive or diabetic or they have right. high cholesterol. Yeah. So there's a lot of denial uh, in the air, obviously, and we, we, all, we all know about that. Um, even even mm -hmm. when people say it's not my portion, many times with the people they hear it from, this is my own opinion, people they hear it from, they don't realize that those same people who are saying it's not my portion, they have a, an army of medical doctors who are taking care of them who are watching over their thing. So they, they, it's not just about it's the, 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 them saying it's on my portion and I have faith. They have an army who of doctors who will watch them every step of the way and make sure that they are healthy. But the average person doesn't have access to that. So it's very important that you don't take things for granted and you don't live in denial. I think that's a big thing where, where we're concerned. I don't know whether it's the African thing or whatever. We're just like, where that's somehow God is going to take care of it. All right, so I, I think we, we, yeah. we, all, we, all, we, I think we, all, we all know that. But another thing that I'm, I'm seeing, and we're going to go back into prevention a little bit, is that we're seeing that these diseases of hypertension and um, atherosclerosis and, and so on and so forth, don't just start when you're in your 40s and 50s. The seeds of these things have started way earlier. And I think that, so before you become hypertensive, there are already things that are happening in your body that make you, mm -hmm. make you compromise your cardiovascular system, for lack of a better word. Can we, you know, go further upstream and let's like, examine some of those things? Okay, first thing is your family history of illness. Mm -hmm. If your parents, either one of them are hypertensive, or either one of yeah. your parents had a stroke, or either yeah. one is diabetic, or either one died of heart disease, then you're at risk, even from the day you were born, you are at risk. Now you've been at risk doesn't mean you're definitely going to get hypertension or diabetes, but you right. have the risk. Now, other things are eating habits. You know, the habits we have as adults, they are formed when we're children. Right. You understand? So many adults are obese because they didn't learn how to eat properly. Many adults don't exercise because they didn't learn that they need to exercise when they were younger. It's not part so of our culture. Honestly, I agree with that culture as well, because for someone like me, sometimes when you're walking on the road in Lagos, you know, you're walking down the road to buy maybe milk or something, people pull up and say, oh, are you okay? What happened to your car? Why are you walking? <laughs> you know, what's going on? It's almost like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know, just, yeah. just today, you know, my mom was telling me, why do you keep going to the gym? You're a married woman, you know, you're supposed to have some flesh. So, so the culture kind of encourages people to be overweight because in Africa, when you're overweight, then it means you have arrived. It means you're wealthy. That's right. It means That's you right. have a good amount of cash. So you can't afford to be skinny, quote unquote. You understand, right. you understand what I mean? Right. Yeah, so, so apart from your hereditary and your, your, her, your, um, your inheriting the gene for hypertension and diabetes, also your lifestyle from when you're young and the habits, mm -hmm. things like, not wanting to waste food. We see a lot of moms 
ended up being the family dustbin because daddy ate food, he didn't finish it. Junior ate food, he didn't finish it. <laughs> I can't waste this food. So she eats everything, even though she has had her dinner. You know, and then mommy starts adding yeah. weight. Right. So let's, before the break, let's talk about that, that food aspect a little bit because we just say food and food in general. One of the things, problems I see with the Nigerian food, first of all, you don't see any, anywhere in the world where they use the Nigerian diet as the archetype or as the, the example of, of healthy food. We hear about Mediterranean diet, we hear about Japanese diet, we hear about whatever, 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 whatever vegetarian, whatever, but you don't hear about Nigerian, Nigerian diet. And one of the things I used to point out when we first started the show was that um, this is our propensity for starchy foods, Eba, uh, Inyo, I'm from Ikiti, so I mean, it's not, no, it's, it's not abnormal for you to eat Inyo three times a day. And, of, and even the, 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 where the nutrients are really should be, like in the vegetables and all that, we cook the, you know what, out of it. We really cook and fry and whatever, whatever. So even the nutrients that we're supposed to get from plants, and when we're not there, so we're left with very, very little options when it comes to protective nutrients that can protect the cardiovascular system, um, protect the brain, and so on and so forth. Let's talk about some of the, the, I mean, what you've seen about diets a little bit before the break. Okay, so Nigerian diet is, it's heavy on carbohydrates. It's heavy on starch. Yeah. And we don't emphasize protein enough. And like you said, the vegetables are cooked within an inch of their lives. Yes. So, <laughs> so, so the education now, what I tell my patients, because the honest truth is that in Nigeria, you know, it's hard to get so much fancy food. You know, everything is imported, dollar is going up, everything is expensive. So even mm -hmm. though people are trying to be on a healthy lifestyle diet, they still can't afford, you know, foreign food per se. So, but we can customize our Nigerian food to make it healthier. Take, for example, if you take less portions of starchy food, so less portions of your pounded yam, you know, eat more vegetables. And then now we're telling people, don't overcook your vegetables. Steam lightly, you know, just rinse, steam lightly, make sure they're still crunchy when you're eating. You understand? Mm. Eat more protein. Now, healthy protein, fish is relatively cheap, you know, eat more fish. Eat more. And it comes from when we were young, you know, this poverty thing, oh, only daddy eats fish, only daddy is the biggest piece of meat, you know, the kids are not allowed to eat meat, it will teach them how to steal, you know, things like oh, that. Egg. So people are just, or oh, egg, thank you. The things that are good for you, people say, ah, no, it's not good for children, oh, no, you know, things like that. So I think with education, you know, that is going to change. And that's why a show like this is fantastic. Because when people watch the show, they realize, hmm, okay, so I can actually still eat my Nigerian food and still be healthy, just cook it in a different way and change the proportion of what's on my plate around. And then it wouldn't be that bad. Perfect. And of course, Thank reduce you. the oil. Reduce oil. We eat a lot of oil in, 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 in Nigeria. And that's so a great that's that's a great point too and and what we're beginning to find out is that even vegetable oils the so-called healthy oils granite oil vegetable oil, canola oil and so forth are actually not as healthy as we think we, we think they are especially when you fry them they're actually exactly. quite bad so but that's a, i guess that's another story for another time let's take a short <laughs> break now and then we will be right back <laughs> All right, welcome back. I'm here with Dr. Muni Adani Jo, who is the Chief Medical Director and Co-Founder of Naveen Healthcare. And we're talking about cardiovascular health and Nigeria, as you can see behind me. That's a very, very important topic, not just for Nigeria, but for people around the world. Cardiovascular disease is the number one killer worldwide. Let's not forget that. Uh, anyway, um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of other things, just not just today, but on the next in the next uh, shows or next next episodes, things like about sitting, why sitting down for too long could be a problem, why your uh, the health of your teeth, the health of your gums, your mouth can affect your cardiovascular health. Um, what happens when your heart gets old for the, those in their seventies and eighties? What to do about it, and so on and so forth. So we're going to really touch on all these small small things, but today we're specifically focused on women's health, the, the, the health of the female heart. And 
as you can notice, as you notice, and I'm sure she's going to talk about it. Women's uh, uh, heart health was a few a few days ago. So let's talk about women's health and, and the heart, uh, money for a few minutes because I think that's very important. Okay, so many people, you know, think that all women's health is about is breast cancer and cervical cancer. People forget that women have hearts as well. And it's interesting to note that even in women, heart disease and stroke are still the leading causes of death in women. Okay. That's right. And it, uh, yeah, and, and it's interesting because the symptoms of you know, ischemic heart disease in women are different from those of men. It's not mm. as dramatic. Well, yes, it's not as, yes, sometimes they have the dramatic, oh, clutch my heart kind of chest pain. But many times what they feel is a tummy ache. Sometimes what they feel is just pain in their jaw. Sometimes what they feel is just nausea or they just pass out, you know? So they have such non-specific symptoms that people tend to overlook. You know, you wouldn't know she's having a heart attack until it's too late. Many screening programs, you know, get what women just talk about, oh, examine your breast, do your pap smear they forget that heart disease is still the leading cause of death in women all over the world, even in Nigeria, even in Nigeria. I think, I think that's a great point because I was watching a, a seminar one day about this lady, she's a cardiologist herself, white, and she was coming, she was basically uprising, so to speak. She's like, all the research, the drugs that they're trying, all the radiological tests is all men focused specifically white men focus. So we're going to be talking about the exactly. black, the, ba the black heart, heart as opposed to the white heart, <laughs> if there's any such exactly. thing. And she was complaining that they're not really, for, they, that they just extrapolate whatever they find in men, they say they assume that that's what happened in women. And very interestingly, she showed slight pictures of what cardiovascular disease looks like in the arteries of a man and what cardiovascular disease looks like in the arteries of a woman. And what, mm -hmm how the, the pattern of blockage is. And from the picture, you could see that they were totally different. Yet this isn't talked about much at all. So she's, so I think she's trying to really um, uh, do a grassroots movement, so to speak, to inform people and healthcare uh, people around the world that you've got to look at the woman's cardiovascular illness as different from the man's cardiovascular illness. So you'll be able to recognize it, like you said, be able to recognize it more quickly and more effectively and you therefore treat more quickly and more effectively. And even among women, there's a premenopausal woman and there's a postmenopausal woman. Those two women are even different because the effects of estrogen, you know, it protects you from so many things. And by the time you go into menopause, you know, the, your estrogen cover is removed and then your risks are heightened. So, and then you're right, not a lot of women Black women, for that matter, I know these randomized control trials, you know, and we need to talk more about that. We need to talk more about that because a lot of these trials are done on Caucasians. And you and I right. know that even though we are all human, you know, we're different, you know, we're different right. in our biology and our physiology because of race, migration, and, and, and so many things. So we right. need to, you know, be more inclusive when we're picking our sample size, you know. Do you think women all, should be... Well, I mean, you think women should bring this out when they're going to see their doctor, if, if they're going for the health, the physical or whatever it is that they're going to the doctor for? Do you think they should, are there specific things they should ask their doctor about? I mean, just, I mean, or, or is it just, they should just please check their, my blood pressure and check this, whatever the problem is, or are there, any, are there some things that they can point out? Well, I think every woman, apart from having their mammogram and their pap smear, they need to have their blood work done. They need to know their numbers. So they need to know their blood pressure, their body mass index, their um, blood sugar, their AB, HbA1c, their cholesterol, you know, all those things need to be checked. And ECG mm -hmm. needs to be done. You know, thorough examination also needs to be done, you know, yeah. so that we can know the state of their hearts. Because the um, prevalence of hypertension in Nigeria you know, male and female is almost equal. You know, I think it's male 51, women 49 or something like that. So it's almost the same. So even though it's common in males, but the difference is really not much. So we have quite a number of female hypertensives as well, you know, than, you know, than, than what we think we do have. 
So mm. women, I always tell people, women are not working vaginas and breasts. We have other organs as well. Um, so let's talk about real, real quickly about belly fat. I want us to, to touch on that before we, we, we end this, this show. Talk about belly fat. Because okay, again, so going back to your whole thing about Nigerians, we have to have big belly to show that we are, you know, help, uh, we, we, we have made it. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to note that people just think fat is, is just a thing that just stays there. Now, fat is metabolically active. Fat releases hormones, you know, fat does all kinds of things. When you have belly fat, your insulin doesn't work properly. When you have belly fat, it means that you have insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is a bedrock of so many cardiovascular issues, diabetes and all that. So belly fat, you know, is actually an indicator. So the bigger your belly, obviously, the bigger your waist circumference, you know, the more likely you are to be predisposed to having heart disease. Mm. So the whole idea is you need to eat properly to reduce belly fat. Now, many people assume that you have to do sit-ups or some kind of funny exercise so that to reduce the fat around your belly. Six packs are made in the kitchen. Okay, six mm. packs are made in the kitchen. So your belly fat is a reflection of what you're eating, not the exercise mm. that you're doing. So we need mm. to understand that. Mm. Interesting. I'll unpack that a little bit for us. Okay, so weight loss is 30% exercise, some say 20%, and 70 to 80% what we eat. Now, when you work out, you don't burn that many calories. You don't burn that much fat. Mm. Okay, so it's impossible to eat what you like and then go and work it off in the gym. It's impossible. So the, the best workout you can do in the gym, you burn max 500, 600 calories. And the average Nigerian meal, proper meal of, you know, pounded yam and egusi and all that can easily go above 1,500 calories. So even though you've worked out today, you've burned 500 calories, but you have consumed more than that. So you can't, you know, out exercise a bad diet. Mm. But if you reduce your calorie intake and then you exercise, you know, so you are burning more than you're taking in, then that would help. So a, a lot of things that, you know, we don't, that we, that we think are healthy are really not, you know, like you said, starchy food, the body stores unused energy or used food as fat, and it stores it around our bellies, around our buttocks and thighs and things like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you eat too much, obviously the body will convert it to fat and then store it in your belly because that's like the storage area. Mm -hmm. Something else that increases belly fat is stress and lack of sleep. Because mm -hmm. we need to unpack that as well in this Lagos. Now, when yeah. you're stressed, and when you don't sleep, your body releases cortisol and all kinds of other hormones. Now, what does cortisol do? It helps you store fat in your belly. It increases your sugar level. You understand? The other hormones like adrenaline increases your heart rate, increases your blood pressure. And if this is sustained, you know, the person can develop hypertension, diabetes. And of course, the person will have, you know, a pot belly. And you're wondering, oh, I don't eat that much. Why is my stomach big? It's because you're stressed and you're not sleeping properly. I think that is super, super, super important. That was stress and sleep. And we probably have to do a whole talk on sleep, uh, sleep mm -hmm. hygiene and all that, all that good stuff. Well, one thing I want to say is that people, you need to, if, if you're sleeping at night, maybe you have five hours sleep, six hours sleep, you should have eight hours sleep. But we understand that not everybody has access to that. Make sure that the five hours, six hours, seven hours counts. In other words, don't sleep in a, in, a, in a room with the light on. Make sure the TV is off. Make sure the cell phone is not near you or your computer. Push them away. I mean, we all make that mistake. But one of the most important things I find out is that you can put uh, those, you know, those things they put on the plane. You can just put, oh, yeah. you can just, uh, in Nigeria, we're using those things for face masks. <laughs> but they are meant for the face and the eyes. So just you cover your eyes so you are sleeping in, in darkness because it's only in darkness that your body produces the chemicals that are needed for repair and regeneration, such as melatonin. The body produces, it's only when it's really dark and quiet that the body produces melatonin so your body can recover during the night. And that's really crucial. It's because people are not recovering during the night. That's why they are having, that's why they are more stressed. And that's why the whole 
belly, inflammatory part things and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we are almost at the end, but I want to give you the last word, something to share with our people around the country and around the world. Okay, so, so, so whoever is watching this, you know, don't wait until there's a problem before you have your annual checkup. Now, doing an annual checkup or doing your blood pressure is not just for rich people, it's not just for people that have money, it's for every single human being, okay? If you can't afford to go to a hospital to do a full checkup, at least, you know, go to a pharmacy store or if in the middle of the market, there are people that walk around with blood pressure machines, do your blood pressure, do your blood sugar if you can. And when you are told that you have hypertension, I reject it is not a health plan. It's not my portion. It's not a way to treat disease. It's nobody's portion to have hypertension. I always tell people, if you stand in front of a moving train and you close your eyes and say, the train is not coming towards me and you still stand there and you don't move, the train is gonna hit you. So the fact that you reject hypertension doesn't make you less hypertensive than you are. So, so that's just it. Love it. Absolutely love it. Dr. Muni Adani Jo, thank you so much for making the time to do this. We definitely want you on very, very, very soon. So God it's bless and uh, appreciate it. Appreciate it. And folks, thank you for joining us. Remember, these videos are going to be available on the NTA website, uh, YouTube channel, and also on our channel, brainandbodyfoundation.org. And remember, we have... Uh, every Friday, you can always reach out to us. Well, I think second and, th and last Friday of the month, you can reach out to us where we are for free, especially for the underprivileged in society. We're treating brain disorders, including, uh, what is it, cerebral palsy, seizures, um, sickle cell disease, Down syndrome. And of course, we've been given the approval by the federal government to do so. So Make sure you take advantage of that. If you haven't, if, if you don't know about it, or if you have friends who or family who who need that help, uh, let them know so they can reach out to us. So till then, until next week, we'll, we'll say it so long and God bless. Bye. <laughs>